Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Saturday University Lecture Series held on the second Saturday of each month. Our current series is an exploration of the theme, Plunderers and Collectors. Thank you all so much for joining us today. We're really excited to have you here. Uh, I am Rachel Harris, the Gardner Center Coordinator and also the Asian Art Conservation Associate for the Seattle Art Museum, so welcome. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that the Seattle Art Museum is located on the homelands of the Duwamish people in their traditional territories of the Suquamish and Muckleshoot peoples. We further acknowledge the many urban indigenous people who call Seattle home. Today, I am so delighted to welcome Yuriko Kuchiki to Seattle University. Yuriko is a Japanese author and journalist whose books and magazine articles explore the history, politics, and social dynamics of the international art scene. In 2011, publisher Shin Chosha released her most ambitious investigation titled House of Yamanaka, the company that sold East Asia's treasures to Europe and America, which is now in paperback. House of Yamanaka is the first published narrative account of Japan's pioneering family of international art dealers based on interviews, letters, government documents, and records of sale dating back to the 19th century. Before moving to New York City in 1994, Kuchiki was the deputy editor of Esquire Magazine's Japanese edition in Tokyo. Kuchiki's feature articles have appeared in GQ Japan, Esquire Japan, Figaro Japan, Departures, Gei Jutsu Shincho, Bungei Shunju Monthly, and the Yomiri newspaper. She has a BA and an MA in International Public Administration from International Christian University in Tokyo. She also completed three years of PhD coursework in political science at Columbia University Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. After Yuriko's talk, we'll have some time for questions. So if anything comes up for you as you're listening, please feel free to go ahead and post it in the chat or the Q&A. And now I am delighted to turn this over to Yuriko. Thank you, Yuriko, and welcome. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining today. My name is Yuriko Kuchiki. I'm an author and journalist living in New York City. I'm originally from Tokyo, Japan, which uh, uh, Rachel introduced me uh, to. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Seattle Asian Art Museum, especially Xiao Jin Wu, curator for Japanese and Korean art for inviting me to this Saturday University lecture series and giving me an opportunity to talk about Yamanaka and company. I'm also indebted to Rachel Harris, who just introduced me uh, for helping with my research, sending documents and patiently answering my questions. Uh, next slide, please. Yamanaka and Company is an art dealership based in Osaka, Japan. The company was active in importing Asian art to the United States and Europe in the late 19th and early 20th century. It's fair to say that Yamanaka was one of the most important conduit for Asian art in West during this period. It was absolutely instrumental in expanding global audiences for these works. Uh, I just wanted to say before I start uh, the, my uh, talk, um, I have to apologize everyone that I'm going to be reading this talk uh, because there's a lot of material to cover. And I'm also a writer, not, not good at talking, not the talker. Uh, next uh, slide, please. In 2011, I published a book about Yamanaka and Company titled House of Yamanaka, Toyo no Shiho, Obe ni Utta Bijutsu Sho. In English, the title would be like House of Yamanaka, the art dealer who sold Asian art treasure to Europe and America. Next slide, please. 
In 2013, an English excerpt appeared in Impressions Magazine, which is a journal of Japanese Art Society of America, titled Enemy Trader, United States and the End of Yamanaka. As you can see from this title, the excerpt focused on the seizure of Yamanaka during the Pacific War and subsequent dissolution of the company. But uh, my book is much more than that. So today I'd like to talk about Yamanaka's activity in the US and touch on its relationship with Dr. Richard Fuller, the founder and the first director of Seattle Art Museum. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a photo taken around 1910 or 1911 at the tail end of Meiji period. This is a very rare picture of the entire Yamanaka clan given to me by a great grandson of Sadajiro Yamanaka. Sadajiro is, uh, can I, can you see this arrow or, yeah. Sadajiro is in the middle standing. Sadajiro was the most famous and outgoing member of Yamanaka family. And also in some ways, the hero of my book. At the time of this picture was taken, Yamanaka and company was one of the most successful Asian art dealers in the world, with stores in New York, Boston, London, and later in Chicago. Yamanaka was an important advisor to many Asian art collectors, including the Rockefellers, Charles Lang Freer, Henley and Louisine Habmeyer, Granville Winthrop, and Richard Fuller. Yamanaka also had a strong relationship with museums such as New York's Metropolitan, Boston Fine Arts Museum, and Cleveland Museum of Art, and Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, and more. Next, please. But despite all of its success, Yamanaka and company disappeared completely and in a fashion that is uniquely tied to its nation of origin. Japan. When the Pacific War started, Yamanaka's assets from New York, Boston, and Chicago were confiscated and sold off under the Trading with Enemy Act, and company was dissolved. Yamanaka tried to stage a comeback in the 1950s, opening a new store in New York City, but the store was not as successful as, it, uh, as in the pre-war period, and it closed. So who was Yamanaka and where did the story begin? Next uh, slide, please. The Yamanaka family traced its history to an 18th century village headman in Itami, now Hyogo Prefecture. Around the end of 18th century, one young member, Kichibe, came to Osaka and started a Hyoguya business. Hyoguya is a specialized craft that involves mounting paintings and calligraphy in hanging scrolls. Kichibe's son, Kichibe II, started selling paintings and antiques. He had two sons and a daughter, Kichibe III, Kichirobe, and Hisa. So two brothers and Hisa's husband entered the family business. By the second half of the 19th century, the Yamanaka brothers had become successful antique dealers in Osaka especially in the area of utensils for Japanese tea ceremony. In the late 1870s and early 80s, Bostonians Edward Morse, Ernest Penalosa, and William Sturgis Bigelow came to Japan and collected Japanese art, famously including woodblock, woodblock prints by the likes of Hokusai and Hiroshige. These men were a prized customer at Yamanaka store in Osaka as was the dealer Tadamasa Hayashi, who was hugely successful in selling ukiyo prints and other Japanese art in Paris. The Yamanaka brothers were acutely aware of expanding global appetite for Japanese art. One turning point was the Centennial International Exposition in Philadelphia in 1876, where Japanese arts and crafts proved extremely popular. If there were any doubts that Japanese art would sell in the West, Philadelphia laid to the rest. 
In 1894, Sadajiro Yamanaka made his move and came to New York. Next slide, please. Although Sadajiro was not a member of Yamanaka family biologically, uh, he became a leader in expanding the business overseas. According to his biography, Sadajiro was born into Adachi family in Sakai, Osaka in 1866. His father was also an art dealer. When Sadajiro was 13, the father sent him to the Yamanaka family as a live-in apprentice. The boy worked very hard and eventually Yamanaka decided to bring him into a family as the husband of Kichibe's daughter, Sada. So this is the official story, nothing wrong with that. But one day after my book was published, I received a phone call from a fellow Japanese journalist in New York. He said his friend in Japan wanted to talk to me. So when I went to Japan, I went to meet this older gentleman who happens to be a powerful and respected member of art community in Japan. He said that Sadajiro was his illegitimate son. Uh, Sadajiro was an illegitimate son of his great grand aunt. She was born in a prestigious family in Osaka, but fell in love with young medical doctor from Tokyo and got pregnant. So he claims that Sadajiro is actually his great grand uncle. What can you do? Uh, of course, I wanted to find out if this is a true story. So when I met the great grandson of Sadajiro, Mr. Yamanaka, I casually mentioned that story to him. And Mr. Yamanaka looked at me with an utterly blank expression. He didn't say anything. It was a very Japanese moment. He knew that I knew that he knew, but neither, neither of us ever said another word about the story after that. But more importantly, I don't think it's crucial who Sadajiro's parents were. It was more important that Sadajiro was trained and adapted by the Yamanaka family. Either way, Sadajiro became a very ambitious young man. He studied English at the private English school in Osaka with the intention of expanding Yamanaka's business to the US. He thus became a mainstay of Yamanaka's international business strategy. Next slide, please. In early November, 1894, Sadajiro and his cousin, Shigejiro Yamanaka left Yokohama for Vancouver on a Trans-Pacific Ocean liner called Empress of China. Arriving 10 days later on November 20th, from Vancouver, they took the Canadian Pacific train to Toronto and changed train to New York, arriving at the end of the month. Next slide, please. They immediately opened a temporary store on West 27th Street, then found a permanent location on the same street near Broadway in February 1895 next year. They hired a couple of Japanese stock staff, worked day and night, and soon the business took off. In the fall of uh, 1898, Yamanaka moved to a larger space at 254 Fifth Avenue, which is this picture, between 28th and 29th Street. The company remained at this location for 18 years. Next slide, please. So this is also a store in 255 uh, Fifth Avenue. Uh, next slide, please. 1898 is also the year Yamanaka opened its Boston store. At the same time, uh, next slide please, in Boston, they created a tree nursery cultivating bonsai, a new craze in the US aimed mostly at wealthy aficionados. Around the same time, Yamanaka opened a small store on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. In a remarkable span of just five years, uh, next slide please, Yamanaka had stores in three cities and the bonsai business. So these are the people who worked at Yamanaka stores in America. Uh, next slide, please. At the turn of the century, both explosive growth in 1900 
Yamanaka opened a store in London on New Bond Street, where Queen Victoria herself liked to shop. Soon they were able to lease an entire building on the same street, next slide please, which they converted into an elegant Asian art gallery. British royalty frequented to this store and Yamanaka was honored with royal warrants from King Edward VII, George V, and Queen Mary. Next slide, please. This was a kind of a semi-official recognition as a regular supplier to the royal family, which they were permitted to display outside the store. So these two are the royal warrants. It's a wooden, uh, advertising board like this size and uh, Yamanaka still keep it uh, in Osaka office and they are allowed to hang these outside their store. Uh, next slide please. Yamanaka sold two types of merchandise. First, there were objects for daily use by anyone at all. These included inexpensive potteries, decorative goods, furniture, silk pajamas, jays, pearls, and other jewelry, and lots of gift items. Such objects were Yamanaka's bread and butter. Next slide, please. I think these lifestyle-related merchandise play a very important role in Yamanaka's success in America. Because of these products, perhaps even more than finer works of art, Yamanaka was very well known among affluent American consumers. I mentioned their boardwalk store in Atlantic City. This was not Yamanaka's only boutique in posh resort. Eventually, there were similar stores in Bar Harbor, Maine, Newport, Rhode Island, and Palm Beach, Florida. The Bar Harbor store was designed to cater to the Rockefellers who had a sprawling summer house nearby. The Newport boutique was in casino and the Palm Beach store was in a private club. With these outlets, Yamanaka had fully arrived as centerpiece of American culture and social affairs. More important for our purposes were the valuable example of Asian art and antique sold to private collectors and museums. In addition to the Hubmeyers and Lockfellers and Fullers and Fourier, favorite clients included Henry Waters, Isabella Stewart Gardner, Kate Buckingham, Percival David, Oscar Raphael, and Oswald Siren. The list goes on and on. Museum also became treasured clients of Yamanaka with broad interest in works from Japan, China, Korea, as well as South and Southeast Asia. Next slide, please. Yamanaka had unusual skill in procuring these works and also producing its own high value items. The company built a furniture factory and formed a per partnership with pearl farmers to produce high quality products aimed at foreign market. In part, Yamanaka's success lay in its generosity toward local art and antique dealers. The company had buying agents all over Japan and, and was willing to pay top dollar for high value items, recognizing they could charge significant premium in markets overseas. Individual owners loved to sell to Yamanaka and so did many Buddhist temples that had fallen on difficult times. Records show their temples, these temples specifically invited Yamanaka and Yamanaka Asians to visit and appraise painting and calligraphy locked away in their wooden storehouses. These relationships were fantastic resources for the company. Auctions were another critical conduit for art in Japan at the end of 19th century and beginning of 20th century. The Meiji period was a time of rapid and profound social change. Many old samurai and merchant family had to sell their assets to survive. Serving as commissioners to, in the auctions, art dealers had an inside line. This allowed them to let American clients know, for example, that such and such scroll or sculpture was coming up for sale at such and such an auction. 
Yamanaka uh, took advantage of those uh, auctions too. At the same time, Yamanaka itself was producing large scale auctions in New York and London. Next slide, please. One of the biggest produced by, by Sadajiro in February 1913 was titled The Remarkable Collection of Imperial Prince Kang of China. Prince Kang, uh, also known as Prince Gong, was a Qin Dynasty statesman and the son of uh, Doguan, Daoguan Emperor. Uh, 1911, Xinhai Revolution marked the end of China's dynastic history. All members of the imperial family were dethroned. Uh, next slide, please. Prince Kang fled to Qingdao under German protection. He put everything up for sale in his big mansion in Beijing. Uh, again, uh, this is Yamanaka Sadajiro. And uh, the third from the left is Okada Tomoji, who's also one of the Yamanaka. Uh, I think he was at the time the head of London. Uh, so he puts up everything for sale and uh, Sadajiro bought everything except the uh, painting and calligraphy. Yamanaka sold thousands of jades, bronzes, porcelains, pottery, and furniture in Japan, New York, and London. This was the epochal event for art collectors. The catalog from the auction was decorated with an embossed gold design. Charles Freer attended in person to the auction and bought several objects, including bronze base, bus, and ritual vessels. Art dealers such as Jubin also attended and bought pieces. Next slide, please. Through this and other events, Sadajiro continued to grow his business. In 1917, Yamanaka opened its new flagship store with an elegant gallery on Fifth Avenue between 53rd and 54th Street. It was housed in the new, oh, new, new building owned by Yamanaka's major client, John D. Rockefeller Jr. Yamanaka occupied the first, second, and third floor of the building, as well as the basement. In the feature article, the New York Sun newspaper described Yamanaka's new store as follows. Uh, next slide, please. The house of Yamanaka and company, which has had so much to do in in times past with forming the taste of New Yorkers in the matter of Oriental art, announces the formal opening of new and imposing galleries upon Upper Fifth Avenue. This is an event of importance in the, in the art world and will surely contribute interest to the present art season. Watch over the main entrance of the Fifth Avenue store were a pair of huge ceramic guardian lions the building's wall was stone of a soft yellow color delivered from Arizona. Next slide, please. Some parts of the Imperia, such as pillars and stairs, were purchased and imported from temples in Japan. On the second floor, there were about 10 galleries. The larger one could be adapted as lecture halls, while some of the smaller galleries served as intimate display spaces for jade and crystals. Next slide, please. The New York store had the staff of about 40, including many American sales staff. Once the store was established, Yamanaka concentrated on holding exhibition at their own gallery, rather than sending artwork to the auction houses. While business continued in other cities, no other location ever rivaled the New York store. Next slide, please. Yamanaka opened a Chicago store in 1928. And for a short time in the 20s, there seems to have been a store in Washington, DC, but few details of business have been preserved. Next slide, please. I want to point out that point of origin for the majority of works Yamanaka sold in 1910s and 20s shifted from Japan to China 
it became increasingly difficult to procure good quality Japanese art as a result of various regulations that prevented the export of important cultural property. Price become expensive as well. On the other hand, political turmoil in China made it easier for works of art to flow into international market. Yamanaka was well prepared for this shift. It opened Beijing and Shanghai branches in 1917 mainly to procure Chinese art and antiques. Again, they paid handsomely. So people came from near and far to sell various works of art. Next slide, please. The Fuller family's relationship with Yamanaka and company started around 1918. Richard's mother, Margaret, started to purchase Japanese and Chinese art at Yamanaka's flagship store while spending summer in Paris, she had become interested in Chinese ceramics, jays, and snuff bottles, as well as Japanese netsuke, having studied and admired them at the Muse, Muse Gime, Gime Museum, among other places. When the Fuller family visited Japan in 1919, Richard, who was then 22, suffered from acute appendicitis, requiring surgery. The family had to stay in Japan longer than planned. During that time, they enjoyed collecting Netsuke, sold to them by various dealers, including Yamanaka. The Fula family settled in Seattle in the early 1920s. Yamanaka didn't have a store on the West Coast, but having established a relationship with the family, the company continued to send photographs as it did with other American clients. Yamanaka also made a practice of shipping valuable pieces to important clients on loan and paying for their return by an insured parcel post. In addition, Seattle was an important stopover point for Yamanaka family and the staff traveling between New York and Osaka. Some would pay visit to the fam uh, Fuller family, bringing along pieces that might be of interest. In 1934, Richard and Margaret Fuller went to Japan again. Mataichi Miya, the veteran chief buyer who worked at Yamanaka's New York store, accompanied them for much of their visit, introducing them to other dealers and helping them negotiate on objects they would like to buy. The 1930s were a challenging time the decade began with the economic crisis and stagnation after the Great Depression. In 1931, Japan's military began its long aggression in China. As the decade continued, conflict in China expanded further, disrupting all aspects of life, including international business relationships. Art trading was no exception. During this time, art and culture were dragged into the project of Japan's national image building and Yamanaka could not ex escape involvement. Next slide, please. In September, 1935, Dr. Fuller went to London to attend the opening of the Chinese, the Chinese exhibition at Royal Academy. The show ran from September to March to commemorate the Silver Jubilee of King Silver Jubilee of King George V. The show was originally planned by several powerful British collectors of Chinese art, such as Percival, Sir Percival David. Collect collectors and museums around the world were asked to contribute their first class Chinese artwork on loan. The British organizers also persuaded the Chinese nationalist government to participate and they agreed. As a result, the show was able to display magnificent uh, bronzes, jade, ceramics, paintings, and sculptures from various Chinese museums. The show exhibited more than 3,000 pieces of superb quality of, what, of which many had never seen by Western audiences. It was an unprecedented occasion. As the organizers intended, the show demonstrated that China was not just a feudal patchwork of 
fractious warlord, but rather one of the world's greatest civilization with a cultural history of rival, the, with the cultural history to rival anything in the West. Japan wanted to compete with this success, hoping to burnish its international image. The Japanese government organized the exhibit at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts titled Art Treasure of Japan, which ran from September to October 1936. In a public relation coup, Jap Japan succeeded to getting sponsorship from Harvard University to commemorate its 300th anniversary. Trying to equal the PR triumph of Chinese government, Japan put on display many national treasures, including important objects from the emperor's private collection. It was a big success in terms of attendance as well as academic review. The story that has not been told was Yamanaka's involvement in both exhibitions. In advance of the London show, Yamanaka was asked to make a list of distinctive Chinese work of art in Japan that could be included in London event. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Yamanaka agreed because not only most of the British organizers, but also Japanese collectors were Yamanaka's client. British organizers came to Japan to scout the works and negotiate with collectors, but they went back empty-handed. The Manchurian incident was the reason. So they are uh, there uh, in front of uh, Koyata Yasaki's uh, house uh, in the middle, the gentleman with white hair, with white uh, mustache, was uh, beard was uh, Percival David. And you can see the uh, Sadajiro, small figure. Uh, in, so I'm going to explain what the Manchuria incident did for this show. Uh, in 1931, Jap Japanese troops invaded and occupied Manchuria on the basis of a trumped up event, the Mukden incident. Japan established State of Manchuria, Manchukuo, a puppet regime presented to the world as an independent state. The Chinese government appealed to the League of Nations, which dispatched a five member commission to investigate. This report, declaring Japan to be the aggressor, was adopted by the League of Nations, causing Japan to quit the League. The chairman of the commission, Earl of Lytton, also was the chair of the executive committee of Chinese exhibition. So this report that the five member commission uh, gave to the League of Nations is called the Litton Report. Litton was well known in Japan as the enemy of the state. So art collectors in Japan who were approached by the show's organizer feared they would be attacked if they lent pieces to protect to a, project, to a project headed by Litton. But Sadajiro succeeded in persuading a few collectors such as Kaichiro Nezu, Koyata Iwasaki, Kishizaemon Sumitomo, who are very good friends of, Kai, uh, of uh, Sadajiro to lend a few pieces. For Japanese exhibition in Boston, Japan Society for International Cultural Relationship asked Yamanaka to select works of art and negotiate with owners, as well as take care of all the procedural requirements. The society with members drawn from a foreign ministry and the Ministry of Education had considerable clout and Yamanaka responded to their request, sending senior members of the company to Boston to help organize the show. All of this unfolded entirely behind the scene. In the catalog for the exhibit, Yamanaka's name is nowhere to be found. Nonetheless, Yamanaka earned big reward for the effort. Next slide, please. The company held independent sales events tied to both exhibitions in London and Boston and sold a number of important pieces to collectors who came to see the shows. 
in London, Yamanaka held its own exhibition of Chinese art at Nodra's Gallery, showing a total of 108 paintings, sculptures, and pieces of ceramic art. Dr. Fula bought several pieces of Chinese art. For example, uh, the, this paint paintings in the center, titled Scholar Gazing at the Moon, an ink and color painting from the Ming period. The uh, dynamic wooden sculpture right side also came from Yamanaka at the same time. Dr. Fula reported that some of the most notable example came from the exceptionally important exhibition which Yamanaka and company had in London at the opening of the great Chinese exhibition. But this sculpture, uh, I checked uh, the catalog and this sculpture was not in show catalog. So it must have been a private sale around the same time. Yamanaka's independent exhibition mirroring Japanese government show at the Boston Museum was held at the Boston Art Club. Uh, next slide, please. Titled Exhibition of uh, Japanese Buddhistic Art showed uh, 97 pieces altogether. These included Buddhist sculptures, Buddhist paintings, and robe from no drama. Not all of them related to Buddhist theme, but all extreme, extremely high quality. The catalog was ex exquisitely produced and uh, included number of superb color prints. Uh, next slide, please. There are nine pieces of some data, uh, Seattle Art Museum's database that, that Dr. Fuller bought at this show. These works make up the core of uh, Seattle Museum's Japanese collection. Next slide, please. The painting shown here is one of them, titled Crows. Next slide, please. It's a pair of large six panel screens depicting 90 black crows against a gold background. This may be one of the most famous Japanese pieces at the Seattle Asian Art Museums. Next slide, please. The left side is Prince Shotoku at age two. It's a wooden sculpture with a polychrome uh, color with uh, painted color with rock crystal eyed. Uh, this is from Kamakura period, 14th century. The right side is Seishi and Kannon, two bosatsu, two attendants of Amitabha Buddha, also from Kamakura period. Uh, these are uh, wooden sculptures and with uh, beautiful faces. Uh, they are bending their knees slightly to show devotion to Amitabha. All in all, this was a remarkable show with Japanese art. In the quality of catalog and the excellence of pieces, we can see Yamanaka's passionate commitment to promoting Japanese art as an international language. Next slide, please. But right after this Boston exhibition, Sadajiro Yamanaka passed away. The New York Times ran an obituary saying, yes, Sadajiro was president of importers of oriental art object and other materials in this city for more than 40 years. His only son, Kichitaro, succeeded him as head of the business. With Germany's invention, in, with Germany's invasion of Poland in September 1939, heralding the start of World War II, Yamanaka's London operation was temporarily suspended, and most of Japanese staff and their family went back to Japan. Merchandise was shipped to Osaka and the U.S. The manager of London store Kyushiro Inoue left London in November 1940. But the situation in the US was murkier 
Yamanaka management in Osaka discussed what to do in case the US and Japan went to war. While recognizing that time was running out, they couldn't come up with an effective solution. On December 7, 1941, immediately after the bomb bombing of Pearl Harbor, the Treasury Department shut down Yamanaka store in New York, Boston, Chicago, and Bar Harbor. And by the summer of 1944, Yamanaka's com Yamanaka Company's US business was dismantled and its assets were liquidated completely. The legal framework justifying seizure and dissolution of Yamanaka and other Japanese entities in the US was a law called Trading with Enemy Act. It stipulated that property of enemy country could be confiscated and liquidated. In January 1942, after confirming Yamanaka didn't sell war-related objects such as gun and ammunition, Treasury reopened Yamanaka store. They were allowed to sell off inventories stri strictly in order to prepare for closure. Next slide, please. Then in March 1942, the US government created the Office of Alien Property Custodian, which took over Treasury Department role in seizing and managing the property of enemy countries. They started to liquidate everything Yamanaka owned in full scale. What's interesting is the way they chose to liquidate artworks in the stores. Instead of selling merchandise in bulk to department stores or Asian art concerns at once, they decided to keep stores and salespeople in three stores, New York, Boston, and Chicago, and sell off the inventory little by little every day. The custodian's office sent management staff, such as general managers, accountants, to each store, and they worked side by side with Yamanaka employees, including Japanese staff. So on the surface, nothing had really changed. Same facilities, same salespeople. Merchandise was discounted, so things sold well. Revenue from uh, New York store in 1942 was $273,000, which was 70,000 more than revenue of 1941. Next slide, please. But the inventory, as inventory shrunk, rent and labor costs become a burden. The Boston store was operating at the loss and was closed in July, 1943. The custodian's office wanted to reach people who couldn't come to the store. So they decided to publish a catalog of uh, approximately 1,700 items still in stock. Uh, next slide, please. This is the catalog. This is the cover of catalog. And inside, every item has photographs, as you can see. Next slide, please. A short description including period and size. The custodians in New York hired a photo studio and took pictures one by one. In all, 10,000 copies were printed and sent to museum and collectors who were Yamanaka's client. Catalog, well, catalog was also sold for a dollar for anyone who was interested. Price, uh, prices of each piece were not printed. So whoever was interested to buy had to contact, call or write and negotiate with custodian staff. Next slide, please. Dr. Fuller received this catalog in early August. He wrote to Alan J. Mercher, custodian's representative at Yamanaka, New York, expressing interest in 53 pieces and asking the price. This was the beginning of negotiation on price and availability that continued through September and October. Some pieces already had been snatched up by other institutions. According to Rachel, who did provenance research, Dr. Fuller bought about 25 items from this catalog. 
Among them, 20 are identified in current inventory of the Seattle Art Museum. Uh, next slide, please. For example, item number 397 is the in the catalog is a rare limestone sculpture of a standing bodhisattva of sixth century. Next slide, please. Number 407 is also a marble sculpture of a standing Buddha, also sixth century. Both items are now in Seattle Museum. Another example, next slide, please, is number 482. It's a eighth century pottery figure of guardian. There is a curious backstory. Mercher misspelled the price of this figure as $475 in the letter to Dr. Hula. He immediately sent that, uh, next slide please. He immediately sent the telegram correcting price to $875. But Dr. Hula already sent the order based on the price of 475. Mercher wrote back saying he and his superior agreed to drop the price to 475 because it was his mistake and because Dr. Fuller's volume business was high. So Dr. Fuller bought it for 475. In fact, the original retail price of this piece was $2,000. That really shows the steep discount and the government eagerness to get rid of that inventory. By the end of uh, 1943, half of the works listed in the catalog were sold. The revenue for 1943 was $452,000. Next year, in March uh, 1944, the Chicago store was closed. And on April 10, New York store was closed as well. Next slide, please. At this point, custodian's office has been disposing of Yamanaka's merchandise for more than two years. In this fashion, many artistically significant pieces were sold off at the fraction of price Yamanaka might have received. The government decided that remaining inventory should be sold at the auction and asked Park Barnett to handle it. The Yamanaka auction took place from the end of May to the end of June, altogether 4,400 lots in 12 days. They sold everything Yamanaka had in the US stores, including reference book and furniture. This sale totaled about 470,000 $470, $470, Park Barnett took 15% commission after other expense, 391,736 dollars and seventy cents was transferred to US Treasury. New York store was vacated at the end of July and everyone was let go. After the war, Japanese government put little energy into restitution. Japan had signed the San Francisco, San Francisco Peace Treaty, which waived the right to seek restitution for loss and damage during World War II. However, private the companies began restitution efforts on their own. In 1953, 22 Japanese companies, including Mitsui Trading, Mitsubishi Trading, Sumitomo Bank, Mitsui Bank, and all other banks, Mikimoto, Pearls, and Yamanaka, formed a consortium and appealed to the US Congress to pass a bill that would restore assets. But the bill was considered low priority and the whole effort fizzled around 1960. There was one bright note in this story, Yamanaka's brief effort to make a comeback. Among the people who bought at the 1944 auction were several veteran American Yamanaka employees. They bought in bulk and started their own businesses as art and antique dealers. One of them invited Yamanaka's management to relaunch the Yamanaka store in New York. 
in 1952, Osaka Yamanaka bought the store operated by a former employee and restarted Yamanaka and Company on Park Avenue. To lead it, they sent Kyushiro Inoue, the last president of London store. Uh, next uh, slide, please. During its brief rebirth, Yamanaka sold several important works of Japanese art. For example, the Metropolitan Museum of Art acquired irises of Yatsuhashi, a pair of screens by Ogata Korin. Uh, next slide, please. And Morning Glories, also screens by Suzuki Kitsu. After the war, Seattle Art Museum kept up its relationship with Yamanaka. According to the museum's database, uh, Seattle Museum acquired a total of 38 works of art from Yamanaka, New York, and Yamanaka's Osaka headquarters between 1946 to 1970s. But the Yamanaka store in New York and Osaka never had the opportunity or the success of their pre-war predecessors. For one thing, the art market has changed in the ways that affected demand for Japanese art. Maybe Yamanaka lacked the strong personalities or good salespeople. Old age and death also took a toll. In 1959, Kyushiro Inoue, the head of New York store, died. American employee who worked at Yamanaka for a long time and was instrumental in the New York operation died soon after. Kichitaro Yamanaka, Sadajiro's only son, died in 1965. He had one daughter, but no son to succeed him. Succeed him. New York store closed a second time in early 60s. This was the end of Yamanaka's company, Yamanaka and Company in the US. Yamanaka Osaka continued to do business and maintain the small booth in the Hankyu department store until 2003. Technically, the company still exists, but there are no current business operations. Sadajiro's great-grandson still managed, manages Yamanaka's assets, most of which are historical documents, auction catalogs, and reference materials. According to provenance research of uh, Rachel, total of about 600 pieces of Asian art came from Yamanaka to Seattle Asian Art Museum. The vast majority, about 540, were acquired before 1941. As I said before, about 20 pieces in the Seattle Asian Art Museum came from the catalog produced by the Aryan Property Custodian. Though it's not the large number, these works are still worth noting here. Why are they significant? Because the pro Proceeds from these sales went to the US government, not to Yamanaka and Company. In any museum, not just the Seattle Museum, if you see a work of art attributed to Yamanaka between 1942 to 1944, it means Yamanaka was compelled to sell work and the US Treasury was the beneficiary, not Yamanaka and Company. Uh, next slide, please. The Seattle Art Museum decided to tell this history during the war by clearly explaining the provenance and referencing it on the label that the company, each of the 20 pieces when they are displayed. For example, if you look at the provenance of this piece, you will see this language. You can read it, provenance, Yamanaka and Company Incorporated, United States to 1942, uh, liquidation sale by Alien Property Custodian, Yamanaka and Company, Inc. Purchase from Yamanaka, liquidation sale by Seattle Art Museum. And where the piece is exhibited, the, the label says, Sam acquired this Lokapala from Yamanaka and Company, New York, the Japanese owned gallery of Asian art during World War II. At that time, the company's inventory was controlled by the US government. The Seattle Asian Art Museum is one of the very few institutions that provide all this information to visitors. 
In most museums, the viewer is not informed about the liquidation sale and won't know enough to dig deeper into this subject. Today, we closely scrutinize the provenance of art that changed hands during World War II. Perhaps museum visitors should be given more opportunities to understand this history. This may give rise to interesting discussion about the economic and cultural consequences when US government appropriated Asian art from Yamanaka. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yuriko. That was fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing your extensive, deeply Thank researched you. knowledge about Yamanaka and company. Um, and I do have a couple of questions for you. And the first thing that comes to mind when I hear you talking about Yamanaka and company is how much research it must have taken. Was this uh, mostly did you do your research in Japan or are there places outside of Japan where there are Yamanaka and company archives? Um, the, uh, the problem about uh, researching uh, Yamanaka and company is that uh, the documents are all scattered around. Of course, it's uh, there are some documents in at the uh, Yamanaka and Company in Osaka now. They don't. Uh, the problem is they don't have any uh, documents related to the sale. No uh, ledger at all. Uh, so that should come from the museums or collector who bought them. So I went to Freer. Uh, museum, Freer Archives, which uh, Smithsonian, so that archive is uh, open for everyone. And Metropolitan and also Seattle. Uh, these are the three museums that uh, allow me to do a research about uh, the pieces that they bought and correspondences. And uh, the biggest uh, documents uh, Probably the biggest documents are at the National Archive in Maryland. But uh, because I said that uh, because they, uh, they get everything from Yamanaka in 90, when after the war, war started, they also got all their documents where the Yamanaka had and stored it. It's in 87 boxes. <laughs> It's a there's a lot. And when I first went there in 2000, I think 2002, uh, the National Archive has a very peculiar system of uh, researching. It took me a long time to get used to the system. And I don't say that I read every single thing, but I opened every single boxes. Uh, it's 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 a uh, interesting documents, but uh, because of librarian of uh, National Archive uh, doesn't read uh, Japanese, all the Japanese material uh, not organized. So it was, it, was, it was very difficult to read. And uh, so it was what it was very, Difficult for me was what uh, the alien property custodian did uh, during three to four years after the war started. What is the alien uh, property custodian? Never heard of. And I didn't know what uh, their role would be. And then uh, in probably like 19, uh, 2007 or so, uh, I found. Uh, Alien Property Custodians Annual Report from uh, 1942 to 1946. So that helped me a lot. Um, so it's, it's a jumble of uh, uh, documents in Japan and US. And that's why it took a long time for me to write this book. Can I ask what was it that first made you interested in Yamanaka and company? Was it 
something you, an art object you encountered or just something you um, discovered in some of your journalism? Um, the fact that I live in New York and Yamanaka was in New York, but I didn't know anything about Yamanaka. I didn't know the existence even. And one day I was reading newspaper and there's a long article about this particular painting, uh, which is at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And there was a small description that this came from Yamanaka and Company that was the most successful Asian art dealer in New York. And I thought, oh, Yamanaka and Company in New York, most successful art dealer? I didn't know that. So what does this company uh, did? Uh, what, why it was so successful? Let's check it out. That was the beginning. Yeah. Do you, you know, you talked about the early days of Yamanaka and Company in the United States, and um, it just seems like they had such explosive popularity from the very beginning. And you mentioned their housewares that they made and also the fine art that they sold. Do you have a sense of why Yamanaka and Company was able to be so successful and so popular in the United States? I think uh, it was uh, the background of success was this uh, uh, Japan craze uh, in late uh, 19th century and early 20th, or late 19th century, I should say. Uh, it started around the Philadelphia Exposition, international, international exposition, but uh, uh, everybody was interested in Japanese goods. Uh, gift goods, uh, potteries, and, you know, things like that. That was the base for their success. But uh, they, Yamanaka was also uh, very good at, uh, for example, uh, Yamanaka Sadajiro, who was very good at uh, becoming a friends with the uh, uh, curators and uh, uh, billionaires and millionaires who are uh, uh, interested in Japanese art. And uh, so Charles Freer uh, become a very good friend of Sadajiro. And uh, also other salesperson in Yamanaka Company. They, some of them are educated in America. So they are very good at English and they explain they were become a friend and advisor to collectors and and uh, curators uh, many many um, elements made them success and they are very quick to respond to the uh, American people's uh, uh, what uh, their interest or interest in Japanese art mm -hmm. and they are also uh, good at uh, collecting Japanese art in Japan mm -hmm. and send it immediately they are very quick which is one of the uh, success element all right so speed and good timing mm -hmm. <laughs> and good merchandise yeah and it's, thank exactly. you for oh sorry and, and thank you so much for also bringing in today some information about Dr. Fuller and that's specifically related to the Seattle Art Museum. And you mentioned that Yamanaka and company had relationships with other curators and other museums. Mm -hmm. Do you know of any uh, other museums where there are large groups of Yamanaka and company objects or are they sort of scattered? Okay, uh, the largest uh, pieces that uh, bought from Yamanaka is the uh, Freer Museum, uh, which has about uh, 1,600 pieces from Yamanaka. And I think uh, Metropolitan, Metropolitan was uh, about 400. And the uh, British Museum, I think they bought from a London store is about uh, 200 pieces. 
So there are many museums that, uh, and Seattle is 600, right? So there are many uh, museums that uh, bought from Yamanaka. Um, so uh, the Dr. Fula was also a very good uh, relationship with uh, Yamanaka. Um, there's a very famous uh, curator, Alan Priest, Mm -hmm. of Metropolitan Museum. Uh, he also had a very uh, good relationship with Yamanaka and company. Whenever he goes to Japan, he stayed at uh, Yamanaka's Kyoto, Kyoto, Kyoto Yamanaka's uh, 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 family. They had a long, very close relationship with Alan Priest. Mm -hmm. Who else? Um, Tomi Kojiro Tomita. Mm -hmm. uh, who was the uh, Asian art curator for the uh, Boston Museum. He also has a, a very good relationship with Yamanaka. Mm -hmm. um, do you, I, there's one question that um, is about the, the household objects that, were those labeled with a Yamanaka and company label or were they just do you, or do you have you discovered that in your research, or were they lamps that were just sold without any any sort of mark that they came from Yamanaka and Company? I, I think the question is wondering if you found one of these household objects today, would you be able to know that it came from Yamanaka uh, and Company? Yeah, there are some there are marks of Yamanaka and Company, uh, probably. And it says Yamanaka in the middle uh, in Romanized mm. characters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can tell. Yeah. So if you happen to see something <laughs> and you see That's a very Yamanaka. Precious. Yeah. <laughs> you should hold on, hold, hold on to it. Yes. <laughs> hold on to it and <laughs> contact you. <laughs> and you mentioned that, um, you know, of course, when Yamanaka and company inventory was seized by the U.S. government and that um, some of the Japanese employees continued to work at the New York store. We know on the West Coast, we're more familiar with the idea of Japanese and Japanese American residents mm -hmm. going to the camps, the internment camps, but it sounds like that wasn't the case with the employees of Yamanaka and company who were working in New York. Is that true? Right. Or do you, yes. do you know where they went after Yamanaka closed? Uh, uh, yes, the first question is why they could, uh, uh, there are several questions, I think. Uh, yes, sorry. So... <laughs> yeah, maybe the first one is, do you know on the East, could you explain on the East Coast why they were not. They didn't go to. Yes. Okay. So it's uh, executive order 9066, which uh, prescribe a certain area as a military zone, mm -hmm. and can the government can move uh, all or any people uh, to somewhere else. That uh, and the government of. Uh, the Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, prescribed that uh, California, Seattle, uh, California, Washington State, Oregon, and later Arizona, this area along Pacific Coast is a military zone because I think because of uh, its direct uh, proximity to proximity to Japan. So, but. Uh, all the area, all the other area of the United States was not the mili military zone. So the, the Japanese, the people with Japanese descent can live uh, as they did before the war. So they didn't have to go to uh, internment camp or anything. But some of the people in East Coast, like the company president, Japanese company president, were also taken to a, a camp, uh, but uh, expressed, expelled uh, later. 
Um, but most of the Japanese uh, people lived as a uh, regular life. So that, uh, you know, that uh, executive order 9066 was extremely um, unfair uh, to Japanese people. And uh, I think most of Japanese who live anywhere, elsewhere, uh, had to keep a low profile, I guess, during the war. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, the people who worked, the uh, Japanese uh, employees who worked at Yamanaka, uh, they can't go back to Japan when the war started. As a matter of fact, in the summer of 1941, uh, all the uh, transportation and communication stopped between US and Japan. So they, if even if they want to go back, they can't go back. So they stayed on. And most of the people, the second question, most of the people uh, who stayed on uh, Yamanaka during the war stayed on after the war and they become uh, art and antique dealer. Um, there are several very famous a Japanese antique dealer like Seo Umeo, Yatsuhashi Harumichi, and uh, one person, Shirane Shinzo, who worked for New York store, uh, worked a long time for Chinese art dealer, City Lu, and when he retired, he went back to Japan. I just uh, want to tell you, oh, Yuriko, you're getting some wonderful feedback in the comments, people really have loved your presentation. Oh, thank yeah, you. I know you're you're not looking at that, but I just want to make sure you know that the wonderful they're saying excellent presentation, meticulous research, it's wonderful and informative. And thank you for your talk today. So thank you. Want thank to make you sure so you hear that. Uh, and I, also, I, I have, uh, uh, you know, when I was doing a research, I went to uh, the only uh, research, uh, researched museum, uh, not in New York or Washington, this area was Seattle. Oh. And I had a wonderful time at Seattle Museum. So I wanted to do this talk because of that. Oh, good. Well, I hope after the pandemic, you'll come back sometime. <laughs> yes, I would love to visit again. Yeah. And I, there's a, a question about, um, some of the artworks that Yamanaka and company was selling during the Meiji period and about any of the craftsmen, the artists uh, who were creating for Yamanaka and company, were they thinking about Western taste because the objects were possibly going to um, United States or Europe or were they thinking about traditional uh, Japanese aesthetic. Do you have a sense of that? Um, you know that I showed the uh, uh, furniture of the uh, Yamanaka. Yamanaka produced the, uh, those type of furniture. That was uh, very popular among uh, American. That, that particular furniture was showed at the St. Louis uh, Expo. Mm -hmm. And that was very popular at the St. Louis Expo and bought by a Japanese industrialist living in New York. And uh, so it's a uh, Western furniture, table and chair, but uh, with uh, uh, Asian taste. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, that was considered very cool at the time. But Yamanaka also uh, not uh, large furniture, but lots of small uh, crafts, uh, boxes and chest of drawers and stuff like that. Uh, antique um, made in uh, 19th, no, made in 17th century, 18th century. They uh, bought a lot in Japan and also exported. And those were popular too. And I wonder, was Yamanaka and company, did they sell to the Japanese market? Were people in Japan buying art from Yamanaka and company at the same 
the same volume that people in North America were buying, or was it a smaller group of clients? Yes, okay. So at the end of Meiji and Taisho, uh, so it's uh, 1910s, uh, 20s, and 30s, uh, the Japanese art market was very active. Uh, many industrialists, their hobby is doing Japanese tea ceremony. So they were always looking for good tea balls, uh, tea utensils. And uh, as I said, I mentioned in the, uh, my talk, uh, the Meiji was very, uh, Meiji era and Taisho era was uh, uh, population, uh, was very active and changing. And so lots of uh, people who had to, I, I mean, the countryside, there are lots of rich people, but they couldn't uh, make it. So they had to sell their uh, assets. They have to sell their antiques. And so there are lots of auctions and those industrious list who are uh, interested in tea went to these auctions and bought the uh, old uh, uh, hanging scrolls and tea balls and stuff like that. And Yamanaka was one of the successful art dealers, but there are many, many art dealers at that uh, age and they are competing with each other. Uh, they did auction all the time. And sometimes uh, the like Kawasaki family uh, who had the huge shipping yard, they didn't uh, make, they didn't do well on after the uh, Great Depression. They, they have to pay debt and they uh, personally sold their uh, private possession mm -hmm. and pay the debt for the company. And these uh, kind of things were uh, very regularly done. So that, uh, that's why the art uh, data were uh, very active. Mm -hmm. And also I'd like to point out the Yamanaka because uh, they came to New York and they came to uh, London and they saw the Western system of auction and exhibition. They brought in those uh, uh, Western system to Japan and they did a uh, selling exhibition and make catalog before the auction. And they, uh, so they imported the Western system to Japanese market. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So it was, they were, yes, they were going back and forth and bringing some art, Asian yes, art yes. to the West, but also importing some systems for selling art to Japan. Interesting. To Japan. Uh, there's a question about the Yamanaka and company branches in Shanghai and Beijing and how, what role did they play in the larger company? Uh, the thing about China, how they procure, they bought and they brought what they bought uh, was really difficult to research mm -hmm. because there was no document. Mm -hmm. So I can, all I can say is that the Beijing and Shanghai office was there to sort of buy a Chinese, uh, uh, works of art to export to Japan and America. Uh, that's all I can say. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, if there's, no, that's fine. If there's no materials to research, there's it's hard yes. to gain a full picture of what's happening. <laughs> But what I can say right now is that Chinese people are very uh, eager to buy back the Chinese art uh, that was uh, brought to uh, Western market uh, in those times. So 
And if they have Yamanaka name, Yamanaka provenance in uh, Chinese works of art, it's uh, very popular. It's mm. very expensive mm. at the auction. Mm. And there's an, this is a question about the Japanese art market today. And are there any large um, art dealers or companies in Japan that are auctioning Japanese art at the same scale as Sotheby's or Christie's? So I guess the question is, are there Japanese auction houses? Auction house. Yeah, like there are small, or smaller Sotheby's. auction houses, but they are not uh, as active as Sotheby's and Christie's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also there are not so many Japanese uh, old art, traditional art that come to the good traditional art that come to the market. Mm -hmm. Not so many. Mm -hmm. I think uh, most of the good pieces went to a museum. And mm -hmm. once they are into the museum, it's it's impossible to come out to the mm -hmm. market. Right, <laughs> they're there forever. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, um, I think we're maybe, we just have just a couple minutes left kind of wrapping up with the questions. Yes. Um, yeah, and you, mentioned today the Yamanaka family, the company exists, but they are not involved in art collecting or art dealing. Do they have a personal family art collection? I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not an interest that continued in the generations. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and there's a question um, about the Nelson Atkins Museum. Uh -huh. And did was that a collection that you were able to research their connection no. with Yamanaka no. company? No. I, I like to do that, uh, but Kansas City, I can't go to Kansas City. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I have no friends. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have yeah, no I no knowledge about Kansas City. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm trying to sort of a uh, continuation of my book. I'm trying to do a, a second volume of uh, uh, this uh, book. And uh, Kansas uh, Nelson Atkins is one of the uh, place that I would like to do a research mm. about. So that leads into another question. So what current projects are you working on? It sounds, is this second volume also related to Yamanaka and company? Yes, yeah. actually. Uh, see that uh, Rachel, you and I did the uh, webinar at Smithsonian in uh, last April. Yeah, almost a year ago. <laughs> yes, so that uh, webinar really, uh, gave me uh, inspiration for next book. And I, when I put out uh, uh, my first book, uh, the present book in Japan, it was 2011. And uh, at the time there was uh, a very little uh, response for my book, mm -hmm. but uh, it's getting, uh, the response is getting larger and larger mm -hmm. right now. So uh, well, 2011 is not really a good year to write that kind of book because of uh, my book pub publishing date is uh, March 11, which is exactly the date when wow. the tsunami and the earthquake uh, okay. took place. So my book was not really, uh, I, although I can't do it, I couldn't do anything but uh, uh, very little response for that kind of book. But uh, gradually, I uh, receive a lot of uh, response, especially in uh, America and uh, England. Mm -hmm. So I, what I am thinking is to write the continuation of book and focus more on art pieces that changed hand uh, through Yamanaka to uh, uh, American or uh, British uh, museum from Japan. 
I'm sure you'll have, I, I think you're right. There's definitely a lot of interest in your book. And I see, as you mentioned that people in the comments are saying, good luck. <laughs> I know you'll have a lot of readers. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, we will send out a reading list to everybody who registered mm -hmm. today, which you provided. And I know your book, you mentioned it, it's recently published in paperback, but if, and there's no English version. So no you English version. And as a matter of fact, I have to tell you that English uh, paperback edition, Japanese edition is uh, discontinued. Oh. So my book is uh, on Kindle. Okay. There's only version, Kindle version, which is uh, uh, active right now. Okay. And there, there is the article that you've mentioned in your yes. talk is English, yes. and that is included on the reading list for people who would like to uh -huh. yes. read that. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Yuriko. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you, and I know our audience really enjoyed your talk. Thank you so much for your time Thank today. You. Thank you, Rachel. Thank uh, you for being a good moderator. Of course. <laughs> and I just, we're just going to wrap up now. And I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the talk as much as I did. And I also hope you will join us again next month. And let's see, that will be March. Uh, we will be having a talk called Lost at Sea by Natasha Reichel, who's a curator at the Asian Art Museum, San Francisco, on the pathways taken by shipwrecked art. And you can go ahead and register for that talk now. Uh, the information is on our website. And thank you all so much for joining us. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you next time. Okay, and thank, thank you, you Yuriko. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>